And this is the Sumerian village, as it looked like, while they were constructing it. And uh, this, it's too bad you can't see that, because that's almost like a, a Frazetta painting. But this is where the Veneer Raiders, led by Tulsa Doom at the beginning of the picture, come galloping into the village and lay waste to it all. Again, another homage. Alexander Nevsky, which is an Eisenstein movie. Uh, there are sequences from that movie that exactly parallel Conan, the Barbarian. And it, and it was intentional, because John Mulius is a huge fan of Sergei Eisenstein. Now, you can kind of see this, but if you remember in the first Conan movie, Conan's mom is beheaded, but it's all off camera, and you don't see it. Well, when they originally shot it, it was all on camera, and you did see it, but it was so gory that it got them an X rating, and they had to trim the entire sequence. So all you see now is you see kind of like hair falling down the corner of the frame, and Conan, young Conan is holding his mother's hand, and she lets go and just kind of falls out of camera. Well, they built this very elaborate cable-controlled head, which is right there, and um, it, it, it gushed. I mean, I mean <laughs> gushed is not the word. It was like a 20-foot-long fountain that came out of this thing. <laughs> And the way they did it is, I'm going to have to point this out because it's so dark, but right here is the actress standing, and she has this plexiglass shield in front of her. And the camera is pointed here so they can see just her body. And above is, this is a technician holding her head that's all made up. And the way they filmed it was, they, they had the, the sword go through the frame, hit that plexiglass thing, they dropped the head, and it just gushed and they, in slow motion. I mean, it, when you watched it, it looked like it took a minute, you know, to actually hit the ground. And then they had a reverse angle of the head on a mound of snow, still bleeding and twitching, the eyes rolling, and it's trying to talk. And that was all shot. And then the, the NPAA looked at it and said, oh, no, uh, no, no, sorry, you know, that one goes. Melius also had young children being impaled on lances and being thrown around and waved <laughs> during this. And they said, no, no, no sorry, that's not going to work either. <laughs> but of course, mainly the first Conan is about uh, Conan's, the young Conan, you know, having multiple adventures, like this little montage, and meeting people like the Wolf Witch. Cassandra Gaviola, who is still alive and still acting, and also shows up in autograph shows, places like that in Los Angeles. And uh, Bolsa Doom, who of course is the head of this snake cult, the, you know, the, who worships Set, the snake serpent, I mean the serpent god. And uh, Valerie Conesson, oh, in the orgy chamber, uh, which was, again, you know, I, I told you the first day of uh, shooting was the uh, stuff of all that camouflage. Well, that was for the orgy chamber. And the whole idea was that Thulsa Doom's inner circle would take this lotus drug and just get stoned out of their minds and have group sex and eat, you know, like people, because they were all cannibals at the same time. And these were all local Spanish dancers and, um, shall we say, exotic people. And uh, it, was really, it was really an interesting set. I was so happy that that was the first day and I was there. <laughs> and this is me on the set, too. Uh, that's one of the cannibal there. And that, that was a real sword. And that's a, like kind of a nervous smile. <laughs> like, please don't do anything. Um, but yeah, that's me bearded and with hair on top. Uh, God, yes. I'm going to stare at that for a second. Okay. Um, but this is the moment after that huge column falls. And usually they build these things out of plaster or like balsa wood or something very lightweight. And then they put what they call a sort of like a gimbal arm in it that allows it to just drop. Melius didn't want that. This is actually made out of marble. And this thing, when it hit the sound stage, left about a depression about this big. I mean, in the solid flooring of the stage, it was a one-shot kind of deal. And they had kind of worked out where people had to be when it fell. It still didn't fall where it was supposed to. And Sven Oli Thorson, who plays Thorgrim, the guy with the big mallet, who was one of the villains in the first Conan movie, it missed him by about two feet. And no one noticed until they saw the dailies. 
because you know you get all excited about it and all this kind of stuff. But so Conan the Barbarian was um, an interesting and very physical movie. Um, oh, here's Valerie Quinesson who has wonderful eyes. <laughs> um, Valerie, of course, played the princess, and she was a sweetheart. I love Valerie. She was one that we became actual friends after this picture, and we stayed in touch for years. Uh, she did a movie called French Postcards. Uh, she also did one with uh, Daryl Hannah called Summer Lovers. And um, she was just a wonderful person. And unfortunately, in 1988, she was killed in a car crash in Paris. So she never got out of the 80s and died very young. Um, but this is her in her trailer, and uh, that's her signing my Sword of Conan book again there, just before she goes off and does another scene. And that's the book she was signing. And of course, Conan the Barbarian ends with Conan finally triumphant, burning down the Temple of Thulsa Doom and going off to other adventures. And then it ends with him with the shot as King Conan. Now what was interesting was it was supposed to open with this shot. And the whole movie was supposed to be Conan as the king of Aquilonia, as he, of course, becomes in the Howard stories. Eventually, he's sitting there, and he's very, very depressed and cynical and dark. And he kind of hates the life that's led him into this. And he has this rumination about what it was like when he was a child. So it was originally supposed to start with this shot and then end with him getting up and just leaving an empty throne. And they shot it, but then editing and audience previews and other factors being what they are, it was never used. So that's the, what happened with that. Now, very quickly, um, not only was I there, not only was I working for Universal, but as many of you know, I've had a long and parallel career as a writer, and not necessarily with genre stuff, but for Conan, I pulled out the stops. I must have written two dozen, and I'm not exaggerating, at least two dozen cover stories for this film. Uh, prior to the release. This is one of the Cinefantastique issues that I did. Here's the other Cinefantastique uh, issue that I did. Here's the Los Angeles Times Sunday calendar piece where we broke the story about the movie before it came out about two, two months before. And here's another calendar piece I did for the LA Times. Here's Muscle and Fitness magazine that I did the cover story for. And here's Muscular Development magazine that I did the cover story for. And uh, it was really funny. Arnold was so huge, of course, in the bodybuilding community. Uh, and there were all these magazines back then that there was a lot of markets that I could approach, including the cover story I did for martial arts movies. Um, when I say that I love Conan, I'm telling you I'm sincere about it. No one else would go to all this length, especially to write for martial arts movies and cover stories. Um, I also, and I think there are some of you, maybe I think Indy might be out there, uh, who remember me going to all the conventions that I did uh, through 1981 and 1982, where I was uh, actually the studio rep for all of the fantasy product and the horror product and the science fiction stuff that was coming out. And this is me in Seattle at the Space Needle at the Space Center, and we actually had 12,000 people show up for this. It's one of the biggest crowds I've ever done a show for. But these are the people up here in the galleries, and they're on the floor, and this is just a tiny, tiny section. And uh, I was lucky enough to have the studio allow me to bring Sandal Bergman up with me. So the two of us were up there and did a presentation that went on for two hours, and it was really successful. That was a great memory. And, uh, well, you, darn it, you can't see this one. But this is a great memory, too. This is Sandal and I in the orgy chamber again. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, there was a lot of other stuff that came out. This is the L. Sprague de Camp and Lynn Carter adaptation of the movie. They did the novelization. People don't remember, but there it is. Here, of course, is the Marvel Comics adaptation of the movie that came out in paperback and is a regular comic. And here's the Mad Magazine parody. <laughs> Mad Cuts the Baloney. Serves up its own nauseating versions of Conan the Barbarian. There you go. OK, now quickly, Conan the Destroyer. <laughs> now, uh, it, was, it was a very strange experience for me, because I, uh, Conan the Barbarian, I, I have since worked on well over 100 films. And, Conan was so unique, 
and, and had such a mix of, of just the most adventurous, crazy, uh, imaginative, off-the-wall people. And at the same time, they were so dedicated to doing something that hadn't been done before, bringing Robert E. Howard to the screen. And it was such a magical moment. And it had all of this actual intellectual content just below the surface. I mean, you were doing things with Nietzsche, you were doing things with uh, Akira Kurosawa, the, the Japanese director of a lot of that stuff, is in the first Conan movie. Anyway, for a fan like me, it was just paradise. Conan the Destroyer comes along, and they go, well, we've done the serious Conan. Now it's time to do the comic book Conan. And unfortunately, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway, who are very well known in Marvel Comics and written a lot of their scripts and a lot of their comic books, did the first five drafts of Conan the Destroyer. And it was actually quite good, even as a comic book. But then for varying reasons, mostly financial and scheduling and things like that, they had to leave the project. They brought another writer in, a guy named Stanley Mann, a fellow who had written Firestarter, if you ever saw that, with Drew Barrymore. Um, they brought him in at the last moment and did a complete A to Z rewrite two weeks before they started shooting. And I really think it shows in the picture. And it's just my opinion. Uh, but I think what happened was they had to just like streamline everything very quickly and simplify it. But Conan the Destroyer is basically a quest. Uh, kind of Conan at this point in his career is more of a mercenary, uh, sort of a loner type. But he goes off with this group of people uh, particularly this princess, Olivia de Abo, who, by the way, is 14 years old in this picture. She turned 15 on the show. She looked much older. Uh, and, well, yes, she looks much older. Um, but uh, Olivia was sweet, very nice. But, of course, there's the evil queen, Tomaris, who wants to get this magical object so she can bring her dead lover back to life, uh, who has uh, actually been kind of petrified into a statue. And so they are all sent off to go find this jewel, which uh, is the Eye of Amaran. And it's basically just kind of like a very colorful quest journey. Now, this you can't see again too well, but this is Will Chamberlain, who plays the evil sidekick of the Queen. And this was one of Wilt's few, if only, film roles. And Wilt was amazing. I mean, Wilt has since, since he's passed on, um, become famous for other things, uh, <laughs> including the, the, yeah, exactly, his 10,000 love conquests or something like that. Well, I never saw any of that. And, um, and my wife was down there with me when we were on Conan the Destroyer, and he was always a gentleman to my wife. So that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, but Wilt was a trip. Wilt was a really nice guy. Total professional, very friendly, hadn't any attitude, no superstar athlete kind of vibe, and also, believe it or not, a hardcore Howard fan. And one day we're having lunch, and he goes, you know, when I was reading Queen of the Black Coast, and I went, what? <laughs> and he goes, you know, but I really like Beyond the Black River better. And it was just amazing. Will Chamberlain. And it turned out he was this long time, long time Howard fan. And the reason why he got into this was simply to be in something with Conan. So that's the main reason he did it. And of course, the other person who made a huge impression in this movie is Grace Jones. Now, Grace Jones is a Jamaican-born singer. She was a disco queen at the, at the time that this was being made. And Mako, of course, who is in the first movie and returns as a wizard in this one. But in the first movie, you notice he doesn't have a name. This one, they gave him a name. They gave him a name, Akira, but it's really Akira from Akira Kurosawa, and it was kind of their end joke. Uh, but Mako plays a, sort of a wizard who helps Conan out, and Conan has varying adventures, including meeting the Black Guard. But as a film buff, as someone who also just loves movies in general, it was my tremendous pleasure to meet this guy, who is the captain of the Black Guard. It's hard to see him, but it's a man named Ferdy Maine. And Ferdy Maine is a British actor who had been around since the 1950s. And if you ever saw The Fearless Vampire Killers by Roman Polanski, uh, Ferdy plays the vampire, the, the Count Krolock in that. And it's literally one of the best vampires ever put on screen. It's right up there with Christopher Lee, Bela Lugosi. 
uh, just amazing. But Ferdy was a gentleman and had amazing stories. Uh, he, as I said, when he made this movie, he'd already been making movies for 55 years. So it was really interesting to talk to.